Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, a new paper has provided various lines of evidence arguing for the validity of the controversial Tyrannosaur Nanotyrannus, the first remains of the giant carnivorous dinosaur Acrocanthosaurus have been reported from the eastern US, a new baby orca has been born to an endangered population, and more. Starting off the news this week, a study published in the journal Nature Communications has taken a closer look at the highest density matter in the universe, at least as far as we know. The inside of a neutron star contains an enormous amount of mass in a very small area, and this particular study used a combination of observations and theoretical calculations to try to calculate the likelihood that the cores of these massive but small cosmic objects contained deconfined quark matter. Quarks are elementary particles that come together to form larger particles, the most stable of these being protons and neutrons, which make up nearly all of the mass of atoms. This paper is the first attempt to actually quantify the likelihood that the extreme conditions inside a neutron star are sufficient to break apart these bonds and therefore contain a soup of quarks that do not bond to form other particles. It concluded that this was very likely indeed, giving it an 88% probability of neutron stars containing deconfined quantum matter. Another method used for calculation estimated the probability at 75%. A massively interesting study then, shedding further light on the extremes of our universe as we work towards understanding the relationship between the most massive and smallest parts of the cosmos. Also in the news for this week is the wonderful report that the southern resident orcas, a population of orcas which live in the Salish Sea and are endangered, now have a new calf. The southern resident population is made up of three pods, J, K and L. The calf has been born into J pod and J40 is believed to be its mother. The calf was spotted whilst the pod was swimming in Puget Sound and a lucky photograph has revealed the calf to be male. Researchers will be keeping a good eye out for the baby as calf survivorship for the southern residents is low and J40 is a first time mum. This was the third calf to be born in 2023 to the southern residents and it really is something to celebrate as two thirds of southern resident pregnancies end in miscarriage due to a lack of their preferred food, the Chinook salmon. The population also faces many other challenges to their survival such as pollution and noise disturbance. A recent study has also shown that the population is becoming increasingly inbred, so the survival of all calves is of great importance, if this unique population is to avoid becoming extinct. Well, we're starting off the paleontology news of 2024 in an explosive way, as a paper has just been published presenting more evidence arguing in favour of the highly controversial Tyrannosaur taxon Nanotyrannus lancensis actually being valid, and not as has generally been accepted for some time now, as just representing juvenile specimens of Tyrannosaurus rex. Perhaps this is going to become a New Year's tradition, since it was the 1st of January in 2020 that the last big Nanotyrannus study was published, that time arguing against its validity. Nanotyrannus was first proposed as a distinct genus in 1988, based on a small Tyrannosaur skull from the Hell Creek Formation that had initially been described as Gorgosaurus. Paleontologists in the 80s then suggested it was actually from a fully grown animal, therefore naming it as a distinct kind of dwarf Tyrannosaur that coexisted with T-Rex and calling it Nanotyrannus. Ever since then, various papers have been published either supporting its validity as something distinct, or showing that the supposedly mature features were in fact explained by the dramatic changes the Tyrannosaurus skeletons went through as they aged. Other skeletons that have been suggested to represent Nanotyrannus have also been reported, such as a specimen nicknamed Jane and another called Petey. And there are also apparently some undescribed specimens that Nanotyrannus proponents claim to prove the taxon's validity too, such as the amazing dueling dinosaur specimen, which we will hopefully see described in the near future. Various features of these other skeletons have also been explained as showing differences that come with aging and not because they're separate species, however. And the generally accepted view among paleontologists is that Nanotyrannus is not valid. But of course, there are some who disagree because when it comes to T-Rex, everyone just disagrees about pretty much everything. Various paleontologists who work on tyrannosaurs have already expressed their doubts about this new paper, but let's have a look at the lines of evidence that it presents. First, they argue that it's frequently the case that two species of tyrannosaur coexisted, and therefore a second tyrannosaur in Hell Creek is actually to be expected based on tyrannosaur diversity data. 
Next, they argue that no intermediate forms linking the morphologies of Tyrannosaurus and specimens assigned to Nanotyrannus exist, as would be expected for a growth series. They also suggest that the specimens assigned to Nanotyrannus should show similarities to the juveniles of other Tyrannosaur species, but again they contend that they do not. The authors also explain how the specimens are predicted to show rapid growth as they age, very quickly packing on body mass as they approach the dimensions of adult Tyrannosaurus, which tend to have a body mass of around 8 metric tons. However, looking at thin sections of their long bones that preserve growth rings, they argue that their growth in the last few years of life had been slowing down compared to the rate seen in T-Rex specimens, and based on projections of the growth curves, would reach adult body masses of between 900 kilograms and about 1.5 metric tons. This point in particular therefore directly contradicts the conclusions of that 2020 paper I mentioned earlier, which looked at the growth rates of the same specimens and found them to both still be immature individuals that were still growing when they died. The fifth line of evidence presented in this new paper posits that small specimens of Tyrannosaurus rex do actually exist and represent juveniles of this species, and that they differ from the specimens assigned to Nanotyrannus. These juvenile Tyrannosaurus specimens include a still fairly large partial subadult specimen on display at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, plus a single isolated frontal bone. Finally, their last line of evidence concerns the phylogenetic analysis of these specimens that they ran, to see where among the Tyrannosaur evolutionary tree Nanotyrannus would be placed. They found it to be positioned between the branches leading to the long-snouted Graysal Alioramines and the Albertosaurines, and therefore not that closely related to Tyrannosaurus itself. So definitely some interesting points that have been investigated. However, as I mentioned before, some Tyrannosaur workers have already said that they're not really convinced by these arguments, and so this is most certainly not the end to the Nanotyrannus debate. I'm sure we'll end up seeing a proper published response, or perhaps a few, to this paper at some point in the near future, and you can bet we'll be here to report on that. An intriguing new development in the Nanotyrannus Wars then, and I'll be fascinated to see what happens next. In the less controversial paleontology news, there's also been a very intriguing paper published this week describing some unusual features of the ribs of Brachiosaurus. The authors explain how ribs are often not given all that much attention in a lot of descriptions of extinct animals, as they're usually not considered that important in determining the anatomy or evolutionary relationships of these ancient animals. However, they noticed something quite interesting on a rib of the holotype specimen of the giant sauropod Brachiosaurus which has a hole in the rib shaft near the head of the bone. This hole, technically termed a pneumatic foramen, is the result of the air sac system involved with how these dinosaurs breathed, invading the bones and leaving holes, helping to keep the massive skeleton lightweight, while also being part of a much more efficient breathing system than what we mammals have. The presence of this hole further down the rib shaft than in other sauropod ribs, which sometimes show openings nearer the heads of the ribs, suggests that there was perhaps some variability in the extent of sauropod pneumaticity in the ribs, and also highlights the importance of taking another look at even particularly well-known and studied specimens that might still be hiding surprises. Also this week, the BBC documentary on the incredible giant pliosaur skull that was found in Dorset in the UK aired on January 1st, giving us some more information on this spectacular discovery. Found by fossil collector Phil Jacobs when he came across the isolated snout on the beach near Kimmeridge Bay, a team was later assembled to extract the rest of the skull from the cliff about 15 metres above beach level, as shown in the documentary, hosted by David Attenborough. The skull, about 2 meters long and around 150 million years old, looks absolutely incredible after it was prepared by Steve Etches, and it is now on display at the Etches collection in the town of Kimridge. It is likely a new species of the genus Pliosaurus, and preserves all sorts of amazing anatomical details. Hopefully it will be scientifically described soon, and I'm very much looking forward to going and seeing it on display. And finally for the paleontology news this week, we have the brilliant report of the first definite record of the amazing giant theropod Acrocanthosaurus in the eastern USA. Fossils of this incredible carnivore, a kind of carcharodontosaurid that lived during the early Cretaceous, had only been found in Texas, Oklahoma, and Wyoming. However, this new material has been recovered from Maryland. 
this proves something that had already been suspected, that Acrocanthosaurus was a pretty wide-ranging taxon. However, it's not clear if all the material belongs to a single species, or if there was actually more than one Acrocanthosaurus species that once existed. The material described in this new paper are only some fragments of a skeleton. However, it's enough to show that it's definitely Acrocanthosaurus, although it's a lot smaller than the other skeletons known of this dinosaur, and so probably represents a young individual. It's also now the most complete theropod skeleton actually recovered from this particular geological formation, and so it provides some exciting new insight into the distribution and taxonomy of this awesome prehistoric animal. Well, that's it for the news this week. I hope you've all had a happy new year, and we'll see you next time.